On behalf of the American College of Cardiology and the Center for Systems and Improvement, I'd like to welcome everybody to the EMS and Systems of Care webinar series, taking clinical quality to the next level. So I suspect many of you have been a part of these from the beginning, so welcome back. Others may have kind of joined in. Um, this is the ninth webinar in the series that's exploring some ideas about measuring performance and making improvements at the system level. Um, Tom Boothlay, who usually joins me here, uh, kind of co-emceeing along with Mick, and he has adds a ton of stuff, so I'm sad to say he was unable to join us here today. We'll be the lesser for it. Um, but you see many of his accomplishments there, of which there are <laughs> no shortage. So, um, but hopefully he'll be popping in at the, the next one. So as a consequence, we're going to be stuck with just Tim today, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, it's all right. But uh, Tim uh, is uh, uh, very well known in the EMS community, has uh, also uh, many accolades and uh, accomplishments. You can see some of those on the uh, the slide right now. So Tim will be uh, serving as moderator for today's session, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. But uh, Tim, I think you've got a couple housekeeping details you need to cover with us first. We do. Um, so before we start, uh, no, this is uh, this part of the webinar is recorded on video, okay? And because Mick has pre-recorded it, that it'll pop up. Uh, on a separate window. So if you have any issues or difficulties seeing the video, it may be that you have your pop-up blocker enabled. So, so be aware of that. If when we say, hey, let's watch the video, if you are not seeing that video, or maybe even right now, check to make sure that you have disabled your pop-up blocker. So you'll be able to, to see the slides and, and hear the narration from Nick. Now, those of you that are watching it live right now, at any time, you can enter some questions right into the chat box there. Okay, pretty simple, straightforward stuff. Um, there's a control panel, and there's a little triangle there. You gotta click on that, and that'll open up the, the, the text box for you to, to be able to enter your question in. Um, when we get to the end, I will uh, try to address every single one that time will permit. So don't be shy. Feel free to do that. Um, and so we'll just try to select some of the, the more representative questions as when we hit the Q&A part of this. Now, perhaps you're watching this as an archive version. You can still ask a question. So Mick graciously uh, provides his email and not only uh, uh, permits, but encourages people to ask him questions. So at some point in the future, someone is watching this and you have a question, Mick will be there to answer it for you. Um, and you see his email address right there, Mick at improvethesystem.com. Um, and Mick is great about posting these, the video of the podcast very quickly afterwards, and he'll be sending out a viewing link to everybody who had registered for this event, all right? So you've got his email there for, for answering any questions that might come up. Um, so as we, as you have figured out already, Mick is really the presenter here. So he's the president at the Center for Systems of Improvement. Uh, CSI specializes in elevating the performance of community and regional systems for care of high risk, time sensitive conditions and providing EMS system assessments, quality improvement training services, the list goes on. All righty. So the American College of Cardiology works with the Center for Systems Improvement to develop this and other EMS, uh, EMS systems of care related programs and services. And just kind of on a personal note, uh, Mick has been a friend for many, many years. And Mick is just one of those people that when Mick speaks, I listen. All righty. And I can't even begin to describe how much I've learned from this series and how, even though I'm more on the education side, how it's just really is, is helped shape my perspective of things. So appreciate all you do, Mick, and we'll let you take it from here. Well, I appreciate it, Tim. Uh, I really appreciate you being our, our moderator for, for all of these sessions, but uh, without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get the video started. Uh, there'll be a brief pause while that uh, video loads up, so bear with us for just a moment. This EMS and Systems of Care webinar series is brought to you by the American College of Cardiology's National Cardiovascular Data Registry, the NCDR. 
They're the stewards of the Chest Pain MI Registry and its new reporting tool, NCDR eReports EMS. This tool generates STEMI and NSTEMI reports that are specific to your EMS agency, EMS system, or regional system of care using the data that's already been entered by your receiving hospitals. For more information, check it out at acc.org forward slash eReports EMS. If you'd like to watch any of the prior webinars from this series in their entirety, descriptions and links are available. Just scroll down to the resources section of the page. Many of you are skilled at measuring how well your hospital or EMS provider organization is performing, but how about measuring the performance of the systems of care that your organization operates in? These systems consist of multiple EMS providers, hospitals, and other entities, and there are some important differences between measuring one's own organizational performance and the performance of an entire system of care. Now, measuring performance is great, but that's usually not the end game. Measurement just sets the stage for the next step, trying to improve that performance with better processes that yield better efficiency and outcomes. And just like with measurement, there are some differences between how you might improve things in your own organization versus how you might try to improve an entire system of care. So today we're going to focus on ways to measure and improve at a systems level using examples from systems of care for time sensitive conditions. Things like STEMI, cardiac arrest, trauma, stroke, and sepsis. But the general principles and techniques we're going to cover can also be applied outside of that context to other types of systems of care. So let's start with measurement. The way I look at it, systems level measures come in two flavors. First, we have measures that come from a process that takes place within an individual organization, but are later combined or aggregated with those from multiple similar organizations so that we can see how those organizations are performing collectively at a system level. And then, there are the system measures that reflect on the efforts of multiple organizations across the continuum of care and therefore cannot be measured by one organization alone. Let's look at some examples of both. First, let's consider an example where a measure is calculated at an individual agency level and that other similar agencies do the same. We can then aggregate or combine that measure across those agencies to get an idea of how well all of those agencies are doing collectively at a systems level. For example, an EMS provider agency will commonly measure the EMS first medical contact to first 12 lead ECG acquisition time interval on presumed STEMI patients. In a regional system of care for STEMI, let's suppose we have five EMS agencies. They each track their agency's monthly average for the EMS first medical contact to first 12 lead ECG acquisition time interval. To look at how well the regional system of care is doing on the EMS first medical contact to first 12 lead ECG time interval, we will want to look at the combined performance of all five of those EMS agencies. Each of the five agencies are tracking their average on this time interval. But to combine the measures for the five agencies, we do not want to just average the five monthly averages. That's because the number of presumed STEMI cases in a given month at each of the five agencies is probably not the same. The higher number of cases at one agency needs to be recognized as having more impact on overall system performance than by an agency with fewer eligible cases in that same month. Let's drill down into this example with some data to show how this works. In the month of August, our example regional STEMI system had a total of 46 eligible cases seen by EMS. Here are the average EMS first medical contact to first 12 lead time intervals for each of our five agencies, along with the number of cases represented by those averages. If we take an average of those averages, we get a grand average of 11.3 minutes. Now, here's the data on each of the 46 cases. If we average the 46 cases, we get 10.9 minutes. Now, there's not a big difference in this particular example, but it is a difference. But it's important to realize that in other data sets, the differences between the average of organizational averages and the average of individual cases across organizations 
could be much larger. So avoid the pitfall of averaging averages when each organization does not have the same number of cases or impact or importance on the system. Now, that's an example of taking a measure that can be attained by an individual agency and then combining it with the same measure from other like agencies to yield a system level measure. Let's look at the other flavor of a system measure. This other flavor is based on the data coming from more than one organization at different points in the continuum of care. Even if we are looking at just one case, it is still reflecting on the performance of the system rather than just one organization. So staying with our STEMI scenario, an example of this type of measure is the EMS first medical contact to balloon time interval. That measurement considers the combined performance of the EMS crews and the hospitals. And because it encompasses more than one organization, it is inherently a systems level measure. We could look at how this time interval measure is doing with just one pairing of a particular ambulance service and a particular hospital in a particular month. That's still a system level measure because more than one organization is involved, but it does not represent how well the entire regional STEMI system of care is performing, unless of course there's only one ambulance service and one hospital serving that community or region. But more commonly, we will have regions served by multiple ambulance services and multiple hospitals. To look at how well the system overall is doing on the EMS first medical contact to balloon time interval, we would want to look at all of the cases with all combinations of ambulances and hospitals in that region. And here, we see one month of data for that measure. We see the EMS first medical contact to balloon time intervals for each of the 46 STEMI cases from the five different EMS agencies, and they transported those 46 STEMI patients to three different PCI hospitals. This is a closer look at the data from one of those five EMS agencies, Agency A, which had 16 STEMI cases in this particular month. Of those 16 cases, six went to Hospital A, four went to Hospital B, and the remaining six cases went to Hospital C. If we average these 16 cases together from Agency A, we get 83.4 minutes. Here's the data from Agency B, with a total of nine cases, averaging 76.6 minutes. Same for Agency C, with 10 cases, averaging 86.6, and Agency D, with four cases, averaging 78.6, and finally, Agency E with seven cases, averaging 98.2. If we average the five EMS agency averages, we get 84.7 minutes. And this disregards the fact that the EMS agencies had different case volumes. Those agencies with more cases had more impact on the system performance than other agencies with fewer cases. That needs to be considered in the calculation of overall system performance. So if we average the 46 individual cases together in one grouping, we get the more appropriate measure. In this case, we get 84.6 minutes. Again, not a big difference in this data set between the average of organizational averages and the average across all individual cases. But in other data sets, the differences may be much larger. This bears repeating. Please be careful when computing system level measures to avoid the pitfall of averaging averages when each group does not have the same number of cases. So now that we have a handle on measuring performance at the system level, we can shift to how to make improvements at the system level. Earlier, I mentioned that there were two flavors of system measures. One was for measures of a process that takes place within an organization. The data flows from that organization alone. It does not involve other organizations. And we can take those types of measures and combine them with the same measures from other like organizations to get a system level measure on that process. And we use the EMS first medical contact to 12 lead time interval as an example. So to improve that type of measure, each individual organization has to address it internally. But if we're going to improve as a system, there are some dynamics that can come to bear to help drive improvement within those individual organizations. In system level reporting, 
It's common to show de-identified information about individual organizational performance levels side by side along with the corresponding aggregate system level measure. Commonly, we will see a data visualization similar to this one. One of the bars is the system level average of performance, while the other bars are for each of the organizations within that system. The organizations are usually identified with letters, not the names of the organization. Now, in that sort of scenario, each organization knows which letter represents their organization, and this lets them see how they compare to other organizations and to the overall system. The anonymity of using letters for the organizational identifiers prevents anyone from being embarrassed and therefore pushing back against their participation in systems level meetings and improvement programs. And if an organization sees that its performance is pulling the system down, their emotional investment as part of the system can help motivate them to improve. It can also become an issue of organizational pride, even though others don't know which data points belong to which organization. You will know which letter on a bar in the graph represents your organization. You will naturally not want to be on the lower end of performance for the group. You'd much rather be among the organizations leading the pack. But the reality is that it's impossible for all organizations to perform above average. By definition, half will be below average and half will be above average. But the organizational dynamics will still tend to push those below the system average to try to improve. And this is what makes this type of data visualization so powerful. The type of measure we've been talking about are the ones that are within an individual organization's control. Now, to a certain degree, this does put organizations in competition with each other to be a top performer. And if it's a friendly and collegial competitive dynamic, that's great. But to keep this from becoming a dysfunctional dynamic, there's some steps that can be taken at a systems level. One, make it clear at the outset of the system meetings where these performance measures are presented and discussed that the system's purpose is to improve care for patients and the community. The system meetings are not there to advance the proprietary interests of any one organization or category of organizations. In other words, the system is not there to give your particular organization a competitive advantage over the others in the system, nor is it there to improve the situation for EMS providers as a group, or for hospitals as a group, or any other group for that matter, other than for patients and the community. Now, if patient and community interests can be advanced while at the same time making things better for the providers, that's just icing on the cake. Number two. There should be an agreement that the information that comes from these individual organizational measures that gets aggregated together to yield system level measures will not be used by one organization to inflate itself or to put down other organizations in the public eye. To put it differently, the organizations agree not to put this information in ads or other communications for marketing purposes. It's okay to use the information to brag on the performance of the system, but it's not okay to use the data to brag on a particular organization or to put down other organizations. That sort of behavior will quickly erode trust between the organizations and thereby unravel the positive dynamics of the system and the system meetings. And these types of understandings and mutual assurances are best to establish early on in development of systems of care groups before the negative dynamics have a chance to creep in and wreak havoc. So we've been talking about the measures where each organization has the ability to improve its performance on that measure independently. Now, let's talk about the other kind of system measures, the ones that reflect on the interactions between organizations that reflect on their combined impact. These are measures that organizations need to work on in concert with other organizations. And a classic example in STEMI care is the EMS first medical contact to balloon time, the same measure we talked about earlier. The way this metric gets changed in any major way is by EMS agencies and hospitals working together on processes. This may be on joint programs like implementing field acquisition of 12 lead ECGs, 
EMS STEMI alert processes, and processes for taking appropriate patients directly to the cardiac cath lab when there are not compelling reasons to be seen in the emergency department first. And these jointly developed processes can have a very positive impact on improving this shared performance measure of the EMS first medical contact to balloon time interval. And to establish these types of processes, organizations have to recognize that they have interdependencies. In our EMS first medical contact to balloon interval example, EMS has to recognize that the ED and cath lab teams need EMS to be consistent and accurate in their 12 lead acquisition, EMS STEMI alert notifications, and time to hospital arrival estimates. In turn, the hospitals have to recognize that EMS needs hospitals to give appropriate and timely feedback and use the EMS alert processes to actually activate the cath lab, the trauma team, stroke team, etc., prior to ambulance arrival. And no matter how well an individual hospital is doing or how good your individual EMS agency is, improving systems of care for time-sensitive conditions is a team sport. The nature of systems is that system performance is more dependent on how the parts of the system interact with each other rather than the performance of each part considered independently. So at a system level, teamwork and shared process ownership and shared accountability for results is what's going to help drive substantial improvements. The shared accountability for system performance is key. Individual organizations may have accountability to their boards of directors or city councils or county commissions, but the accountabilities are not so clear for the combined efforts of multiple hospitals and multiple EMS agencies and other providers working together as a system of care for time-sensitive conditions. So the first step in creating system levels of accountability is to clearly identify the geographic area and the organizations that comprise your system of care. Next, decide what performance measures the system should be held accountable for, and then create a process by which the region or community can see the performance level of the system, understand what it means, and put it in context. And dashboards and scorecards are commonly used for this. And this is all the general idea behind the public reporting programs we see out there for hospitals and programs like Hospital Compare from CMS, uh, the Joint Commission's Quality Check and Quality Reports programs, and in publicly reported sites provided by clinical specialty organizations like the American College of Cardiology's Find Your Heart a Home site. Those all operate at an individual provider organization level, but we don't yet see many systems of public level reporting dashboards yet around the country. But don't let that deter you. Your local system of care can post its own system measures on your own website. You can establish your own public reporting program for your system and draw attention to it by distributing systems level performance reports to key stakeholder groups. And I'd suggest sending systems level reports on a quarterly basis to the leadership teams at all of the organizations participating in the systems of care group, to the leadership teams of major payers in your area, to the leadership teams of local units of government, and to the media so that the general public can also be informed. But why bring all of this attention to your system of care? You should do it because it will compel everyone involved to be transparent, fully participate, and not be complacent. And this is where context becomes important. You can report the level at which your system of care is performing, but you need to help the public and other stakeholders understand how that compares to the performance of other systems of care. But Unfortunately, that kind of comparison data may not be readily available because we don't commonly see standardized system level measurement across the country in many areas. But locally, you can at least implement comparisons with your own system's past performance. And you can do this by showing a simple run chart that displays how things are performing over time. Show everyone if the trends are getting better or worse or staying about the same. That transparency puts some healthy pressure on your system of care to make progress and not let performance slip. This is a good thing for a community or region, 
This is a good thing for patients. And this is an opportunity for healthcare provider organizations to demonstrate true leadership by taking on a challenge that places the interests of patients and their community above their own proprietary interests. So there you have it, a bit about the mechanics of combining measures from individual organizations to generate system measures. And we've also discussed some ideas on how to structure the organizational dynamics to work in positive ways that can drive improvements at a systems level to benefit the community and the patients we serve. Let's go to the live discussion segment of the webinar for your comments and questions. Thank you, Mick. Well, as always, I learned a lot, although here's what I'd say about this one. I won't speak for anybody else, but for me personally, as compared to some of the previous episodes, I didn't feel this particular time I had so much new information. It was kind of more a matter of, um, Concepts I was already familiar with, just sort of put together, perhaps in a different thing. And uh, so I encourage anybody with questions, go ahead and add those into the chat box and we'll take them as they come. Um, and as we get started, make though, I could not help but notice, boy, did you go to great lengths to, to discuss the issue of averaging the averages. So I guess uh, I got two questions from that. First, what if... You know, do you have any examples, like real world examples of systems that uh, did not avoid this pitfall and, and sort of the, uh, the real world repercussion from that? And then the second would be, well, what if you just don't have that much data? OK, you know, you're trying to get everybody's data and gosh, not everybody is contributing completely. What do you do? Acknowledging that pitfall, what do you do when you don't have the data? Would be the second part of that question. All right. Well, let me take the first part. Uh, the, the issue with averaging averages, I, I put so much emphasis on that, Tim, because I see it happen so commonly uh, all over the country as I, I do consulting and uh, you know just talking with colleagues at conferences, et cetera, when uh, talking to them about how they do systems level measurement. So it's a very, very common uh, pitfall, and I really wanted to call it out, uh, both in context of looking at those measures that come from just inside one organization, as well as when you're looking at, uh, you know, more system level measures where it's, you know, dispatch and non-transport medical first response and ambulance and emergency department and cath lab or trauma team or stroke team, et cetera. It happens uh, in both contexts. And so we need to be careful about that uh, so that we don't get erroneous information uh, that we're making decisions on. And as an example of where that can really uh, create a big difference between the average of averages uh, and uh, the, the true system average, uh, going back to our example, let's uh, suppose we've still got those five EMS agencies, and let's suppose we've got uh, one agency that runs most of the calls. Say they're running you know, 70, 80% of all the calls, and the other agencies are only running very tiny fractions uh, of the total call volume in that system. If they're all weighted av uh, equally, if those smaller agencies that are maybe each only representing a couple percentage points of the overall system activity uh, have numbers that are very different from that one dominant agency. Uh, so. Suppose the, the, the big agency has an average of 10 minutes on whatever number you want to choose. Say it's the first medical contact, 12 lead time. Let's suppose they're averaging 10 minutes. And the other agencies, for whatever reason, that are only running a, a couple percentage uh, points each uh, over the course of a month, they've got much longer times. That will dramatically skew uh, that data uh, to show that the system uh, is performing a lot worse than what it actually is because that main agency is at 10 minutes. That should be given 70, 80, 90 percent of the weighting uh, of that uh, system performance number and the other one's only given a couple percentage each. So it's when you have those extremes, a, a dominant player uh, has an extreme number high or low or a very minor player that only has a couple percentage points of the overall system performance, and they've got a, uh, a, a very 
big number or a very small number. Uh, but in our example of five agencies, that would represent 20% uh, of the weighting really throws things off. So, so that's why I, I, I really want to make sure that people are very, very careful uh, about how they compute those system measures. Got it. Thank you. So now I'm, I'm going to pick up on the second thing that I just sensed you were, uh, you were very careful to stress. Um, and you, you, you talked about the difference between a healthy competitive dynamic versus a dysfunctional competitive dynamic. And, and man, absolutely focusing on, you know, what's best for the patient or best for the community is genuinely exciting. All right. But the fact that you emphasized it so much made me aware, okay, there's got to be a reason that Mick is, uh, is shining a light on this. So are there any, uh, you know, just, I mean, you can, you could pick STEMI as an example. You could pick any topic example. Are there any kind of put some flesh to those bones? Are there any, you know, specifics that you think we should kind of be aware of, or are there, are there ways that we should uh, have our eyes open that perhaps the system could be gamed, gamed a little bit, you know, where uh, we could uh, report in such a way as to, to appear more favorable, let's say. So, so if you could just sort of unpack that whole concept a little bit for me, I'd appreciate it. Sure, sure. So uh, again, the, my experiences behind those comments uh, in this case, uh, unfortunately, are usually pretty negative. It's the sort of situation where, let's suppose uh, one agency EMS agency, hospital, uh, I, I've seen it uh, a number of different ways. Uh, they'll see those system reports and uh, they'll know that their letter C or whatever, and they can see that uh, they're you know, uh, performing uh, well above the rest of the pack and uh, they want to publicly celebrate that. They're, they're proud that uh, they're at that point, but it creates some ill will with the other organizations uh, that are part of that system of care. And uh, it starts creating, you know, ill will uh, at the system meetings and uh, starts unraveling things. And then, you know, inevitably someone else ends up on top of the heap and they start bragging on themselves uh, and, you know, by implication, putting the others down. And uh, the whole thing just kind of quickly spins out of control. And so with that lack of trust uh, and uh, uh, appropriate responsibility at those system meetings and how they use the data starts giving a lot of people pause about continuing to participate uh, in those system level meetings. And those are the kinds of issues that I'm speaking to. So I have seen this happen many, many times in many different contexts, not just STEMI, but trauma and stroke, uh, uh, cardiac arrest, et cetera. And so uh, it's just something that I want people to be aware of and try to prevent uh, by laying out those ground rules at the very start uh, that, you know, we're, we're here to improve things for the community, uh, improve things for patients, and let's not use this information in a way uh, that could have any negative connotations or uh, implications for our colleagues that are also participating uh, in these systems of care groups uh, with yourself. So uh, lay out those ground rules at the onset and uh, you'll prevent a, a whole lot of uh, headaches later on. Awesome. So those are some general stuff. Now we have some questions coming in from the group. Okay. Um, okay. This one is from Kurt. I hope I pronounced it. Rubach. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And here we go. Specific to the measure of FMC, first medical contact to device. What does this organization do if the hospital partner is only paying attention to their measure, that is door to device. Example, we're comfortable with our door to device of under 90 and not interested in addressing first medical contact to device of 90 minutes because that average uh, doesn't look as positive. So what would, uh, what would a response to that be? Sure, so I think that sometimes there's a different sort of response you get from uh, the administration of an organization, be it a hospital, uh, an ambulance service, a 911 center, et cetera, uh, from the clinicians that uh, are actually involved uh, in direct patient care. So I think it'll be very apparent to the cardiologists, for example, 
that the thing that really drives uh, patient outcome is total ischemia time. So, you know, all the way from symptom onset uh, through, uh, you know, establishing the uh, flow through the obstructed artery is the time parameter that we're most concerned about. And obviously, it's not just about door to balloon time. The hospital administrator will be focused on that because that's the one that tends to be uh, put up there in the public reporting systems, et cetera. And that's why I emphasize that we need to do more with getting system level measures out there. So if door to balloon time is the only time that's published or uh, widely shared uh, outside the walls of the hospital, uh, of course, there's going to be a bias towards making the optics on that measure uh, look as good as possible. But the clinical impact is on this broader, not even just first medical contact to device time, but symptom onset to device time. Uh, so if your dashboard or public reporting system or your uh, accountability report to the city council or county commission, public health department, whatever it, it may be, now includes the FMC to device time or even the symptom onset to device time, that's going to broaden that spotlight and take that uh, administrator's focus away from uh, door to balloon uh, and look at the bigger picture that's really impacting morbidity and mortality of those patients. And it really, I think, speaks to the power of public reporting and metrics drives organizational performance. Uh, what gets measured uh, gets fixed. Uh, and so if what we're measuring and publicly reporting is the broader system measure rather than the narrower hospital specific measure, uh, then I think people's uh, attitudes will come around accordingly. So if, if I was confronted with that particular problem, Kurt, I would probably try to find uh, you know, some of the interventional cardiologists or emergency physicians, et cetera, that understand this broader issue and try to have them champion uh, the uh, acknowledgement of the first medical contact device interval as the more significant driver of patient outcome and performance, and maybe try to get something adjusted in uh, the way that that uh, hospital executive's uh, scorecard or dashboard is being presented uh, to include those measures. So hopefully you'll find a, a little bit uh, that's helpful there. That was a great question, and I think a lot of us can probably uh, relate to that question. So thank you for posing that question, Kurt, and thank you, Mick, for, for that answer. Um, Michael uh, has a question here. Says the transport of rural, quote, stable cardiac patients who still require time-dependent treatment in distant facilities does not have the same prioritization and rigor as do trauma systems. Um, how has this infrequently developed in the cardiac care system, and how can this gap be closed so the needs of the cardiac patient can be similarly supported? Did you get that question, Mick? Uh, I you, think I got it. it, it if, okay. if I understand the question correctly, uh, basically Michael is saying, you know, we, we tend to pay a lot of attention to trauma uh, and not as much attention to cardiac patients in, in this uh, particular community maybe that Michael comes from. And I, I think you have to recognize that trauma systems of care uh, is the, the, the long-standing, you know, grandfather of systems of care. It, it's the archetype of systems of care for time-sensitive conditions. And so consequently, there's been a whole lot more time for uh, legislation to be passed, for uh, the registries to develop, uh, for uh, funding to be established, putting all this emphasis on trauma. For example, at the state level, we'll, we'll very commonly see a state uh, trauma registry system, uh, state level reporting, uh, you know, at the, how well things are doing with trauma, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, more recently, we started to see this more and more commonly with cardiac. Now we're seeing some in stroke. Uh, you know, we may see stuff start to creep in with sepsis. Uh, cardiac arrest, uh, I think, is, is getting a better and better foothold uh, as more and more states adopt the CARES registry throughout their entire state. 
So these other conditions are getting some traction, but trauma systems of care have been around a long time. Uh, they have been able to, you know, get the right legislation passed, get funding established, et cetera. And uh, the other systems of care would do well uh, to learn as much about how trauma community got all that done uh, and uh, try to take some pages out of their playbook and do the same. And for those who do work at the state level uh, listening to this webinar, I would encourage you to start thinking about time sensitive conditions as a grouping rather than just thinking about trauma. And we do see that in a number of states. We start seeing uh, state level STEMI coordinators, state levels uh, stroke coordinators, uh, it's state level uh, cardiac arrest coordinators. Uh, so this is starting to happen more and more commonly. Uh, so I do think we're making progress, but as Michael points out, there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay, some excellent questions here. Um, all right, this one's from Marshall, and he starts off with some kind words for you, Mick. Um, and then he goes on to ask, what advice would you give to someone who wants to engage external stakeholders, hospitals, local government, et cetera, uh, to develop and public reporting uh, system level measures? And do you have recommendations on how granular you should report your data? So uh, I would not recommend getting real granular with the public reported data. I would keep it fairly high level. Um, and uh, because it's just difficult for the public to wrap their arms around a lot of the details, uh, you might have a uh, maybe a publicly accessible detail page or something, uh, but it, it may be something more that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the hospital administrators and the emergency department directors and the trauma director and the semi director, et cetera, those kinds of people uh, would be able to access. But the thing you put out to the general public and you promote to the media, et cetera, I would keep those at a relatively high level. And uh, wherever possible, I would try to report on nationally accepted standard uh, definitions uh, that are publicly reported. Because there is a little bit of a difference, I shouldn't say a little bit, there's a significant difference in how you report things for improvement purposes versus how you report things for uh, accountability and compliance purposes. So for improvement, you want a lot of granularity so you can drill down, find root causes, work on improvement projects, et cetera. So you want access to a lot of that detail uh, in what you're examining uh, versus at a, a high level of public reporting. Uh, you know, it, it may be wise to develop what's called a composite measure where you take several of those process and outcome measures and you combine them together to have an overall, say, STEMI care index or a trauma care index uh, that reflects overall on how the total system is working uh, within a, a single number is uh, one strategy that uh, you know might be worth considering. But again, if you go with those nationally standardized definitions, those have typically been very, very well vetted uh, by uh, statistical experts as well as uh, clinical and science experts to make sure that uh, the information is accurate, not misleading, uh, is methodologically sound, et cetera and uh, use those whenever possible would be my recommendation. Awesome. Excellent. Stan has two questions. One was just a simple, hey, can I get a copy of your slides? And I'll let you speak to whether or not that's available or if the video is, is the preferred resource for that. The second question, um, I'll just read it directly here. It says, can you comment on an innovation that occurred in the Seattle area the innovation was performing CPR with chest compressions only. I'm not completely sure what aspect uh, Stan is asking about there, but I, I just wanted to provide that to you, Mick, to, to see what uh, your thoughts are on that. Uh, could you repeat the first part of the question again, Tim? Oh, well, the, the first one was just uh, asking about a copy of your slides versus- Oh, okay. The yeah, slides. Slides. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, the, the, the video is, is, is is, is what uh, we'll, we'll uh, be uh, uh, making generally available. And uh, 
what happens after we finish this live webcast is uh, Tim and I both record uh, ourselves off of our uh, webcams or other gear. Uh, so rather than just seeing this slide that says questions and comments, you'll actually see Tim and I uh, talking uh, for as we're course. answering questions. <laughs> yes, for better or worse, exactly. So uh, anyway, it, it uh, actually makes for uh, uh, a little bit more uh, visually uh, appealing uh, version of the webcast. Uh, and so uh, that's what will be available there. Uh, but uh, and again, I'm I'm sorry, Tim. The second part of the question was well. Before I give you the second part, I just gotta say if you if you've got me on board for visual appeal, ooh, your uh, your selection skills were in question. <laughs> so uh, well, and then Stan, his his second one was is can you comment on an innovation that occurred in the Seattle area? That yeah. innovation was performing CPR with chest compressions only. Yeah, so compressions only CPR has been uh, demonstrated in, in a lot of different research studies uh, as being a, a very effective uh, tool to use, uh, primarily in medical or how should I say non respiratory etiology cardiac arrests, uh, drownings, or cardiac arrests secondary to uh, respiratory compromise uh, isn't uh, as uh, desirable to use. Uh, uh, compression only CPR, uh, but it does overcome a lot of the barriers that we've seen uh, that people have psychologically about doing mouth to mouth resuscitation, particularly in a COVID area, right? So, uh, or era. And uh, so uh, getting the compression only CPR done uh, is something that is being very, very broadly encouraged. Uh, uh, by all the, the major scientific groups uh, in that space, American Heart Association, the ACC, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, so there's strong science behind it. And if you go into Google Scholar or PubMed or one of those medical literature databases and type in hands-only CPR, I'm sure you'll find lots of citations to the direct science you can read for yourself. And it isn't just in Seattle. This is uh, being promoted worldwide. Awesome. Well, we're we're not at the end yet, but we're getting we're approaching it. So I want to give you a, a chance to address implementation. So trust me, folks, I'm actually going somewhere with this. If you think I'm wondering, well, I'm actually going somewhere with it. So early 1980s, I was a college student at Florida State University, and I was taking an American history course. Typically, when you take American history, the textbook is such that you start at a given date and you 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 take a cursory view of all the significant historical events until the, to an end date. All right, kind of a survey course. This professor says, hey, there's this great new textbook out. I still, it's one of the few textbooks I still have from college. It's called After the Fact. He goes, we're not gonna do that. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pick 12 critical events in the course of American history. And instead of just surveying them, we're gonna drill down really deeply. And it started with like the Salem witch trial and it progressed to Truman's decision to drop the bomb. Okay. And, but what was so unique about that was, is that instead of trying to cover the entire landscape, by virtue of picking things that really had interest, students were engaged, we, we ate this up, and we were digging in and we're learning the difference between primary source and versus, you know, secondary source, and it was really incredible. And I think people walked away with more of an appreciation and love of history. So what's that got to do with today? Here we go. So you are laying out all this stuff. And I'm not trying to say you're doing it incorrectly, but it could be overwhelming for people. And if they were going to start with the first video and try to implement that, and then go to the second video and try to implement that, that could be a lengthy process. So, so having said all that, speak to, if you would, Mick, the people that are going to jump into the deep end and kind of take that approach like I talked about from that history class. Instead of starting with the elements of your first, you know, sessions and, and implementing those and building, what if they just jump into the deep end and they pick a project and they want to do something system level? What advice would you give for, for somebody who is going to attempt to implement these, these kinds of concepts through that, that approach? Well, uh, I guess my recommendation would be to, to, to try to find, uh, even if it's a small group of kindred spirits, uh, uh, there's a, a quote from Margaret Mead, and I'm sure I'll uh, screw it up here, but it's something to the effect of, 
you know, uh, don't ever think that uh, something significant can't be accomplished by uh, an individual or a small group of people because it always has or something to that effect. And the, uh, the implication here is, is that you can have a big impact uh, if you're willing to be the champion of a cause. And that's the way I look at it is, you know, I'm, I'm out here trying to be a champion for uh, systems of care for time sensitive conditions and and trying to focus, you know, uh, my professional activities on uh, trying to, to move the ball forward in that realm. And if within your organization you want to be the champion of, uh, say, trying to improve STEMI care uh, within your organization, that's great. Uh, but uh, I would recommend trying to find a couple people to work with the, the medical director, the QI person, the administrator, et cetera. Uh, let them uh, understand your passion about the issue, your willingness to work on it, uh, and uh, you know, try to do whatever you can uh, to help get a seat at the table uh, to help influence these things. Earlier in my career, I was very frustrated with a lot of the protocols that were written. So I had some conversations with uh, some of my early medical directors uh, and said, you know, if, if I take some time and I, you know, redraft the protocols, uh, would you be willing to take a look at them? And, you know, most of the time they'll uh, be uh, accepting of, of that kind of uh, input, particularly if they see you've done your homework and, and put in the, uh, the sweat equity to, to put it together. And that dramatically differentiates you from the rest of the group and can sometimes get you that opportunity uh, to influence things uh, at an organizational level and a system level, uh, even if you're uh, you know, still working as a field level provider. Because that's the kind of the dilemma I was faced with early in my career. I loved being a, a frontline paramedic. I wasn't particularly interested in becoming a supervisor, but at the same time, I wanted to seat at the policy table to influence protocols. So with some determination and a little bit of uh, political savvy and talk to the right people, uh, I think you can uh, oftentimes find support uh, where you need it. And again, feel free to use my email address and I'd be happy to talk with you more offline about that. Hey, I appreciate it. I don't know if anybody, maybe it's me and my ADD brain, but that approach just seems almost more likely, more organic starting with something that's uh, significant to a group of people, rolling your sleeves up and getting going. And all of a sudden you're like, gosh, you know, we, we could do more if we had better data. Well, what would it take to have better data? Okay, so then you start to implement those things. Well, gosh, if we had all the systems doing this, that would be better. Okay, well, let's work on it. Again, it could just be me and my, uh, my ADD bias, but that just seems like a, a more likely scenario for implementation. But we need to start wrapping this up, Mick. One final comment on, on, on that note, though, Tim, because uh, uh, this is too juicy to let it pass, in, in my okay. view anyway. When I first started working on these sorts of things, I had access to my data on the calls I ran. And I actually started putting it into my own spreadsheet and calculated my own performance measures on my own calls and tried to do quality improvement in spite of my departments uh, rather than because of them. So uh, just some food for thought there. That is perfect. See, that's what I'm talking about. Is, is it rather than try to turn that whole battleship at one little degree at a time, maybe just, just find something you can start with. And if it's an EMS person and a hospital person and they're just going to just make this happen, kind of a skunk work sort of an approach. I always, I always have a fondness for that. So <laughs> I'm just laughing at the thought of you with it because not only back then, Mick, not only not, you were not only the only person doing your own QI, you were the only person who knew what a spreadsheet was back then. All right. So, so you get, uh, you get points for both of those. You're dating right, me there, Tim. <laughs> yes. All right. So we've got to let these good folks go. Um, thank everybody for, for making the time to, to be here. I appreciate you, Mick, for, again, for just everything that you, you genuinely care about the industry, you care about this, you care about patients, and it's just a passion for you. So just thank you for thank you for being Mick. And um, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. And so there's a few things you could get more information on. There's the the new e-reports EMS reporting service for AMI. All right, so you can visit acc.org/slash 
eReports EMS for updates, or you can also view some of the prior webinars from this series there as well. Now, the, an, an alternative to view the webinars is you can go to EMS Quality Academy. That's from Beck. That's from CSI. So EMSQualityAcademy.com. So either of those will, will get you access to the, the previous recordings. Thanks a so bunch. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you, Tim, for uh, being our moderator again today. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, you know, you bring a, a lot of uh, insight and uh, I think content expertise to, to all of these webinars. Uh, and it is just a very, very uh, sincerely appreciated. For those of you who may want to reach out to Tim specifically, uh, you can uh, visit his website at ecgsolutions.com or send him an email at tfalen at mac.com is shown on your screen. Unfortunately, Tom wasn't able to join us today, but uh, if you do want to reach out to Tom, uh, his uh, contact information is shown there on the screen, email, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, Tom is uh, pretty uh, active on social media, uh, so uh, look for his posts. And on behalf of the American College of Cardiology and the Centers for Systems Improvement, thank you for watching the webinar. Please share the links to the uh, recordings with your colleagues, and that'll wrap it up for today. Thank you very much.